but this morning I want to talk to you about a prayer template. I've taught this on a number of occasions, but it always is good to review things and bring, back, bring it back to our memory. And being that this uh, Thursday is the National Day of Prayer, I want to just share with you uh, what we commonly call a prayer template, which is what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew's Gospel, the 6th chapter, and again in Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Now, more appropriately, we really should call this the Disciples' Prayer. Because in Luke's Gospel, uh, it tells us that one of his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples how to pray. So actually, this is really how we pray, right? And so in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is talking about seeking first the kingdom of God and so forth, and he brings this in. And let's look at verse uh, 9. It says, in this manner or like this, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So Jesus here is he's not giving us a prayer, although I don't think it's unscriptural to pray this prayer. But um, it's, it's not actually, well, this is how you just pray this prayer as a prayer. And again, I don't think it's wrong to pray that prayer. I grew up in a church where we prayed this prayer every single Sunday. And um, again, I don't think that's bad, but this, is, this prayer was much broader than that, that aspect of this prayer. And um, so let's look at this because I believe that what Jesus was giving us here is a template for prayer. So in other words, he's saying along these lines, this is kind of the format to follow when you pray. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the New Testament in the early church uh, that they're not necessarily biblical commandments. They're not like, thus saith the Lord, these are the rules, like the Ten Commandments. They were more, these are the format for following. For instance, Dan and I were talking about, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, where it talks about corporate worship and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Paul was not in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 giving us a, a step one, step two, step three. He was given the church at Corinth a format for order. But he wasn't saying, if you don't follow this order, you're sinning against God. <laughs> because that's not what he was trying to get at. He's saying, this is just a template that you can follow um, in order to make sure your service has some order to it. Amen? And a lot of the Bible has that type of application, and we have to commonly, we have to understand the context in which the Scripture is saying. So this is what Jesus was really getting at here. He was trying to teach us that this is a format you can follow in your prayer, but I think it's an excellent format. And I think we can learn a lot from it, and it does give us some really good biblical guidelines. Excellent. So, first of all, he starts his prayer out, and he says, when you pray, pray along these lines, our Father, which art in heaven, who is in heaven. So the very first thing Jesus does is he tells us something here that's very important in prayer, and that is the focus of prayer. Because when we pray, our prayers are to be directed to God. You know, I've been in a lot of prayer meetings over the years and listened to people pray, because when you're praying with other people, you're not just praying to God yourself, you're also praying with other people. And I've been in a lot of prayer meetings over the years where you'll have one or two individuals, or you'll have this individual, and they'll start out praying, and their prayer pretty soon, it's like, are you talking to God or are you talking to me? You know, and they'll start preaching this preaching prayer like we need to and you need to and blah, blah, blah. Well, our prayer is not to us, our prayer is to God here. So we have to keep that right. So when we pray, we want to get our eyes on heaven, because it's from heaven from whence cometh our help. The, the psalmist said, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. It's a, it's an, a, a poetic way of saying, I'm going to lift up my eyes to God, because God, my help is from the Lord. Amen? So we have to, first of all, when Jesus said, when you pray, get your eyes on God. 
Get your eyes on God. And specifically says, our Father who art in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Because when Jesus said we pray, we direct our prayers to the Father. Now, it's not wrong to talk to Jesus, and it's not wrong to commune with the Holy Ghost. But a lot of times I've heard people pray, and they say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Jesus himself said we don't focus our prayers to Jesus. We focus them to the Father. And why do we do that? Because the authority of the Godhead flows from the Father through the Son into the Holy Ghost. Remember Jesus said when the Holy Spirit has come, he will not speak of his own, he will take of mine and make it known unto you. When you talk about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is always going to point you to Jesus. So we always have to be careful of people that are going, well, this is the things of the Holy Spirit, but yet it always ends up not pointing us back to Jesus. If it doesn't point you back to Jesus, you need to really step back and say, wait, is this God? right? Because the head is Christ. And Paul said to the church at Colossae, Colossians, he said to the Colossian Christians, he said, some departing from the faith, they don't hold to the head who is Christ, but they try to corrupt you through vain philosophy and, uh, and things and the, the exaltation of angels. So we always have to be careful of, of teachings and doctrines that try to build camps around things other than Jesus. That's a good point, in case you didn't get that. So, amen could go right there. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So, we always have to keep Jesus as the head. So, when we pray, Jesus said, when you pray, pray along these lines. Our Father in heaven. So, get your eyes on God. We've got to keep our eyes on God. Sometimes we can... No, no, you know, prayer comes in lots of shapes and forms. Um, we don't want to turn prayer into a formula. Because when you turn prayer into a formula... Uh, when it's just kind of a formula, then it becomes lifeless. And it becomes... So prayer is talking to God. And talking to God in all types of shapes and forms. There, there's, you know, God doesn't hear us more because we yell. God doesn't hear us more because we speak King James English. God doesn't hear us more because, because of this or that or though. God hears us when we pray according to His Word. God hears us because we're born of God. And, uh, but God, God understands what we're saying. Um, so we don't want to turn it into a formula, but again, this is a format. So first thing to remember in our prayer life is we've got to get our eyes on God. Get our eyes off ourselves, get our eyes off our problems, get our eyes on God. Amen? Amen? So this is the format Jesus gave us. And he said, our Father in heaven, which is really quite a cool concept when you think what Jesus was bringing in here, because... Uh, Jesus referred to God as his father. It wasn't common in those days for the Jewish people to think of God along the line of being their father. They thought of him as God. But Jesus brought this concept that he's my father. I, my father is greater than I am. I and my father are one. So he's talking of God on a more personable relationship as a father. And so he says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So, what do we do? All prayer, I think the format for prayer always should begin and end with praise and thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise, we come into his gates with thanksgiving. Praise is talking about who God is. God, you're awesome, you're powerful, you're, you're, you're an amazing God. That's praise. You're declaring who God is. Thanksgiving is thanking God for what he's done and who he is. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for all the blessings in my life. So enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise. This is why when we come to church, we start with worship. That's all why, uh, and I apologize, we weren't quite on our game this morning. But anyhow, we have some of those Sundays like that. But um, we start with worship. And we start with praise, and we start with thanking God, because that's the format. That's the format that we're to follow. And I think all prayer should begin that way. Prayer should always begin with, thank you, Jesus, that you hear me. Thank you, Father. It's so good to be with you. Praise you, Jesus. In any way you want to use that. But I think prayer should always begin with thanksgiving and praise. And I think it should always end with thanksgiving and prayers. Because first of all, we thank God that he hears us, and we end with saying, thank you, Father, that you've answered us. Amen? Amen? So I think everything we should do as a Christian should always be seasoned with praise and worship. 
uh, from the rising of the sun to the place that it goes down, the name of the Lord is to be praised. David said, seven times a day, O Lord, I will praise you. So those are great things to remember. So uh, just keep that in mind that when we pray, get our eyes on God and hallowed be your name. So again, this word, this term, hallowed be your name, was a very made a lot of sense to a Jewish person because Jewish people that Jesus is talking to his disciples that are Jewish, what does it mean, hallowed be your name? That means may your name be held in awe and reverence. Amen. Amen. We watched this clip this morning about the name of God. And so in Jewish tradition, the name of God has always been considered the most holy of all the aspects of God. His name is holy. And um, the Jewish people, um, during the intertestamental period time, uh, they had this idea that you don't write the name of God down, you don't even speak the name of God outside of the temple. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons when you read the Bible, it'll use in his name, or Adonai, or the Lord, instead of stating God's name, because the writers, and if you talk to a person who's Jewish today and they talk or ever write to you or write an article, you'll notice that when they write the na even the generic God, G-O-D, they'll always put an a underline and not put O in there, and it'll just be G slash D, because that's a sign of reverence. I don't want to mishandle the name of God. That's a great thing to know. And, and we need to be uh, learn something about that as believers as well, that we need to keep the name of the Lord as holy and reverent. Now that doesn't mean, uh, you know, we're born of God and we have his name and uh, we talk about the name of Jesus and we, you know, because, uh, and we talk about the name of God, but uh, the point is he is God and we need to reverence him as God, amen? So it's very important we don't treat the things of God frivolously. So what Jesus is saying, get our eyes on God and put God in the position in your mind where he is. Whether you put him there or not doesn't make him there. The fact is that he is there, that he is God, causes us to lift our expectations higher. We're talking to Almighty God here. We're talking to the creator of the universe. But not just the creator of the universe, we're talking to a God who is so tender and dear that he calls us his children and we can call him Abba Father. Paul said in Ephesians that we can come boldly into the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need, that we have access into the beloved because of the blood of Jesus. So we have this amazing relationship with the God of the universe that we can come into his very presence and we're in his very presence, but we can approach him in a way without fear or inferiority, without uh, any intimidation. The Bible calls us righteous, and the word righteous means to be upright. It means that there's no, nothing between us that keeps us from God. That's what righteousness does. We could say that righteousness is the ability to stand before God without guilt, inferiority, or condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? that God has made a living way through the veil of the flesh of Christ so that all believers who are born of God can come right into his throne room without fear. Just as Jesus said, whatever I pray to the Father, whatever I ask my Father, he hears me. And I know he, because he hears me, he will do what I ask. And he said the same thing to us. He said, when you pray, in that day you will ask me nothing, but whatever you ask my Father in my name, or as if I were asking it, is what he's literally meaning, as if you had the power of eternity, eternity uh, as if you were standing there, as if you were me, you can ask the Father. That's what that means. So sometimes Christians think that when we say that in the name of Jesus, um, that it's the period at the end of the sentence. And that's kind of how traditionally we've used the name of Jesus. Well, in the name of Jesus, bunk. But that's not really what the word, the term in the name of Jesus really means. What it actually means, and I'm not saying we shouldn't use that, you know, we cast out demons in his name. Jesus said, in my name you will cast out devils, you will speak with new tongues, you'll uh, take up serpents and scorpions, and you'll drink deadly things and will not, in my name. Well, what was he meaning in my name? As if I were there. Yeah. 
as if it were me. Because when we go in his name, we're going as if it was him. Amen? Remember when the seven sons of Sceva came to cast the devil out of the demon-possessed man in the book of Acts, and they said, we adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of the man, and the demon speaks through the man's voice and says, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but I don't know who you are. And the man jumps on him and beats the snot out of him, and it tears their clothes off, and they go out of the house beaten and naked and bruised because they weren't operating in the name of Jesus, because they weren't in Jesus. But see, we are in Jesus because we're born of God. And because we're born of God, we have been baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. That means we're one with Christ, we're bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, the same Spirit that flows from the vine, flows through the branch, flows through the vine, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. We are born of God, we are born of Christ, we are born of His nature, we are Christ bearers, we are Christ in the flesh. We are the living epistles of Christ, known and read of all men. So literally, we are, the, we are the body of Christ. Does that make sense to you? Now, we know there's only one Jesus, right? But we're born of Jesus. We the, have the spirit of Jesus. And we're um, called sons of the living God, just as Jesus is called sons of the living God. So when we go in the name of Jesus... We're going as if Jesus himself were here. Because what are we? We're, a po we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As if Christ were there in the flesh. Amen. And that's why Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away. Because when I go away, I will send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, who will take a mind and make it known to you. He will be with you and shall be in you, even the spirit of truth whom the world does not know. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Amen. So, glory to God, that's a revelation we have to get a hold of, folks. So that's what we really mean when we say, in the name of Jesus. And so when we come to cast out devils in the name of Jesus, yes, we can speak in the name of Jesus, come out of them, in the name of Jesus, do this, that, that is fine. But we have to recognize that I don't necessarily have to say in the name of Jesus, I can just say, come out of them, because I am Jesus coming to you. I come in His authority. See, I can't cast out devils in my authority. But I can say, come out of them, because the authority of Jesus Christ in me gives me the power to cast you out. Amen? Amen. You notice that when Jesus cast out devils, he didn't say, I come to you and I adjure you in the name of the Father, did he? Because he said, the works in the Father in me does the work. Well, we could say the same thing. Christ in me does the work. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, right? Amen. So again, I'm not saying it's wrong to say in the name of Jesus. Not saying that. I'm just saying there's a broader concept that we have to grasp than just using Jesus like a tag. Amen? So this is what Jesus literally meant. So he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen? As in earth as it is in heaven. So praise be to God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Because this is really the objective of prayer. So we come into the presence of God with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. We get our eyes on God. We're talking to the Father. We're addressing our prayers to heaven. And then what's the objective of our praying? We're not just talking for the sake of talking. Our objective is to bring heaven into earth. Thy kingdom come. Now when he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what he's literally meaning is the kingdom of God influencing and saturating and filling earth. Remember Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So we're talking about a king of a kingdom, and the objective of that kingdom or that king, Jesus, is to bring his kingdom to bear on this earth. So think of it as if you were a king or a soldier in an army of a king from another country, and you were sent to this other country to bring about 
a battle, in other words, to do battle and overthrow the armies and the government of that country. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Because we're, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my disciples would fight for me. They would fight to see me free. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So we're talking about a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, invading and influencing and changing the natural kingdom. Now, I want to be very careful when I'm talking about this because I'm not talking about what's called kingdom now theology or dominion theology. And, and, and let me verify what I'm talking about when I talk about dominion theology. We understand that we do have dominion. We do have authority, right? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations. We are to disciple nations. We are to see the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. But that's not what dominion theology or dominion now theology teaches. Uh, dominion theology is a form of preterism, which believes that there is no such thing as a millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and there is no such thing as God using the nation of Israel, that it believes in what's called replacement theology, that now the church is Israel, and the nation of Israel is really illegitimate. Um, and what dominion theology predominantly teaches is that the believers will basically become more and more influential and powerful and they will basically take over the whole world and then they will usher in the kingdom of God by taking over the whole world. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that we are going to become more powerful and take over the world and usher the kingdom of God in by taking over the world. Now does that mean we should not try to bring God's kingdom to bear in our world? No, because our founding fathers certainly understood the concept of establishing this nation upon biblical principles, right? Should we just, and this is the problem <laughs> that hap has happened to the church in America since the 1930s and on, is the church, instead of being the light of the world in the city on a hill and engaging the culture and bringing the weight of the gospel and bringing the weight of the kingdom of God to bear on the culture, has removed itself from the culture and abandoned the culture and allowed the culture to rule the world. That's why we have all these secularists in our nation running our government. You have people with this notion that, well, you should keep your religion out of politics because, you know, there's a separation of church and state. Don't you know that? So, in other words, what they're really saying is the only people that should be running our government and institutions and making law are secularists or people that don't believe or have any reverence of God. Is that really what God wants? <laughs> Obviously not. What he wants is his people to be in positions of authority and influence places. I mean, if God's people aren't in government, if God's people aren't in positions where they can af affect policy and affect what happens, then what happens? Ungodly people. That's why we're seeing the mess we've got going on in our nation today. This is why we've got ungodliness at every hand, because God's people have not done what they should be doing. We're not even voting for people that we should be voting for. Amen? That's, and so, in the respect, we need to, we need to bring God's kingdom to weight. Our, our Christian faith, our biblical worldview, should affect everything we do. It should affect who we vote for. It should affect our positions on every issue. Every single political issue, every single piece of legislation, every single policy the government establishes has a moral ramification. Well, is that not how God, should God say, well, you know, God really doesn't care about those things. He's only concerned about heaven. Of course not, because those moral ramifications affect people's lives in bad ways. So everything has a moral ramification. So everything we should have a biblical opinion about. So when people tell me, well, you're too political. No, I'm heavenly minded. I'm kingdom minded. And my biblical worldview affects how I live my life and how I look at things. So I don't just look at, well, you know, uh, you shouldn't follow that archaic book that was written all these years ago. We're living in a new world. Yeah, a pagan world. And that paganism doesn't work. Look around you. It does not work. Look at the nations that have abandoned God. Look at Hindu nations. Look at Islamic nations. Look at the other nations. How's that working out for you? Not very well. 
Amen? So, uh, so that's how we should be living our lives. We should be trying to influence people. We should have Christians that are rise, raising up and running for public office or getting on school boards. Who are, who are getting on township boards and running them from a biblical moral view where we have godly ethics. One of the reasons we have a lot of corruption in our government today is because there's not enough of God's people influencing the climate and holding people to accountability. Amen. So, you know, again, <laughs> and I hate to even have, we should not even have to say this. We should not even have to say this, but the fact is you have to say it because people have been brainwashed into non-biblical beliefs. So, so um, you know, I'll hear people say stuff like, well, don't mix religion and politics. That's like saying don't mix spaghetti and noodles. <laughs> you don't, you can't, if you don't have God's influence in your political system, then you have nothing but paganism. And frankly, I disagree with secularism. I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, it's, and I could go on and on and on about that. But I think you get the point. Amen. hate to have to even talk about that as much as I do, but I wanted to drive that point home. So hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So again, uh, we need to make a distinction between what's called dominion theology and God's kingdom coming. We want God's kingdom to come, and we want to influence the culture as much as we can. But no matter how much we influence the culture, we're never going to turn the world into heaven on earth. We might have seasons of heaven on earth. We might have nations that we can turn back to God. But if you look throughout history, every person that has ever tried to build like a city to God, it's always failed. It's always crashed and burned. Now, does that mean we shouldn't, we can't have places where we can, you know, try to uphold godly principles and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think we should. But we're living in a fallen world. We wouldn't be in this condition right now if it wasn't for the fact the world has fallen. Amen? And all it takes is a few generations, one generation to fall away from God, and the next generation comes along and they're pagans. Israel proved that. I mean, they had the cloud by day and the fire by night, and they had the presence of God in their camp, and they still couldn't keep it. And the next generation came along, and they fell away from God. So we're not talking again about what we commonly call dominion theology. We're talking about taking dominion and trying to influence the world. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because what are we praying for? If we, do, if we don't want the kingdom of God influencing earth, then we might as well not pray, right? Because when I'm praying for our leaders, what do I want? I want our leaders to do things that are godly. What did Paul say? He said, first of all, I urge that prayers and supplications and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and those in authority, that we might, we might lead a quiet and peaceable life, for God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What's he talking about there? Well, he, we pray for our leaders so our leaders don't make wicked laws. We want, yeah, we don't want leaders who oppose what we're trying to do. Because that's a problem. We've had leaders in this nation. We have leaders right now in some of the areas of our nation. We have judges that are wicked and oppose the kingdom of God. I mean, we wouldn't look at this situation with this a Christian baker out, Jack, uh, what's his name, out in Colorado, who's had to go to court twice to defend his faith because somebody wanted to target his Christian faith and attack him for standing for his biblical values. That stuff happens all the time. Look at the kids that are constantly getting kicked out of public, public schools just because they bring their Bible to school, just because they wear a Christian t-shirt, just because they want to express their faith in a uh, schoolroom. And, and people have this notion, well, you don't bring your religion into our schoolroom. These are no religion zones. Unless you're a Muslim, then you can come in. Uh, or if you're a Hindu. So really the only issue is Christianity. Um, and that's the only ones, uh, you know, uh, that, that are attacked. Uh, but that's just nonsense. And if we just put up with that stuff, we'll be bulldozed into the ground. 
You know, this is, this is one of my pet peeves, and I talk about this, one of my pet peeves with modern day preachers in America is they think they're going to soft sell this culture into the kingdom of God. Well, we don't want to be too strong about how we preach about these things. We don't want to take any stand because that's separating. That's going to make people mad. It's going to offend people, and they're not going to come to our church. I don't want you coming to my church anyhow if you're going to be a doughhead. The church is not about lost people. The church is about winning lost people, getting them into the body of Christ, and getting their lost minds changed. Instead of accommodating them. What kind of people you want in your church? You know, I, I'm, I just don't pull punches about this stuff because I think it's black and white. You know, if you're for abortion, there's something wrong with you. If you think you can kill a baby when it's born, there's something wrong with you. And if you profess, I'm a Christian, it's amazing how you get all these people that are pagans telling us how to live as Christians. Well, since when do you know anything about the Bible? Yeah. Well, this is what Jesus would do. Jesus wouldn't build a wall. Jesus, it's the Jesus, you know, Nancy Pelosi, for crying out loud, you'd think she's a preacher nowadays. It's the Christian thing to do to not build a wall. Hey, Nancy, you got a lock on your door? Yeah. Come on. Uh, we're not that stupid. God didn't say be stupid people. <laughs> well, anyhow, I'm getting off on my soapbox here. But, but anyhow, let's go back to our regularly scheduled pre program. But one of my pet peeves is we need to take a stand. He says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So we want God's kingdom to come. When we're praying to God, Lord, we need your kingdom in the earth. We want you to bring your kingdom to bear. We want you to influence our leaders. We want you to change their hearts. We want you to raise kings up and bring kings down. If there's wicked counselors, the Bible says that remove the dross before silver and will come forth as a pure uh, lump of silver. Remove the wicked before a king and his kingdom will be established forever. We need godly counselors for our leaders. We don't want wicked, ungodly, ignorant counselors talking to our political leaders. Amen? Amen? We want, and if our political leaders are doing things that are wicked, we don't want God to bless them. I don't pray, oh Lord, bless them. I don't want the blessings of God on them. Now, God blesses the good and the wicked. But what it's saying there is we're literally, the Bible tells us, don't bless wicked people. What does he mean by that? Don't say, God bless you. So if somebody's doing wicked things, I don't go, oh, God bless you. What does that mean? May the virtue and goodness and blessings and prosperity of God come upon what you're doing. No, I don't want God's prosperity coming on what you're doing. I want God to be merciful to you. I don't want God to judge you, but I certainly don't want God to bless what you're doing. Amen? So what do we want? To, what do we pray when we're praying for the wicked? We pray, Lord, we pray that you would turn their hearts away from wickedness. We pray you'd bring, you'd, uh, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and as the water works, he turns it wherever he would. So, Lord, we pray that you'd turn the king's heart. You'd confound the counsel of the ungodly. Amen? I want confusion in the camp of the wicked. I don't want the wicked prospering. I want the wicked to be confused and confounded. You know, if they're, if they're scheming wicked plans to come against the kingdom of God and come against the Lord Jesus Christ, if they're enemies of the cross of Christ, I don't want God's judgment on them, but I sure don't want, I don't want them to prosper in what they're doing. I want God to confound and confuse them and bring their, their plans to naught. I want him to cut them off. I want him to circumvent and, and turn that away. You know, just like he did in the Bible where, where kings were going to come and do certain things. They were going to attack Israel. And they prayed and they fasted and they sought the Lord. And what happened? The Lord supernaturally rose something up or brought another king or did something to change that. That's what we're praying about. That's what prayer is all about when we're interceding for our nation or interceding. We want God's hand involved. So we're, in, we're crying out to heaven, Lord, we need your power in the earth. We need you to come and come, out, come down, O oh Lord, and shake the heavens. Let the nations know that their butt drops in the bucket. Let the kings of this earth and the leaders of this earth tremble before you. Why do we want that? Because the Bible says there is no fear of 
of God with the wicked. One of the things lacking in this nation among the wicked is they don't fear God. So we want them to fear God. Do you mean you want them to be afraid of God? Yes, I want them to be afraid of God. I want them to reverence God and respect Him. Amen? Amen. So that's what prayer, so thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we're praying, and that's praying for nations, but also in our daily lives, Lord, I want your kingdom to come in my life. Well, what's, what's thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What's the will, like, will of God like in the heaven? Is there sickness in heaven? Is there turmoil in heaven? Is there confusion in heaven? Is there depression in heaven? Anxiety in heaven? Fear in heaven? No. So if we're praying for people, this is what we're talking about. We're trying to pray the will of God into the earth so the will of God and the, and the presence of God comes into the earth in such a way that it drives out fear. It drives out sickness. It drives out the, the, the things of this world. You know, when God comes on the scene, guess what leaves? The devil. When light comes into the room, darkness is dispelled. The reason the darkness isn't dispelled is that Excuse me, there's not enough light in the room. We want God's presence, God's power, God's influence, and God's substance to fill this earth. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise be to God. So we want His kingdom to come, His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then He goes on, give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. Your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So what is he referring to when he talks about give us this day our daily bread? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, what he's referring to there is having a daily relationship with God. The children of Israel in the wilderness, when they came out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness, they were to go out every day and gather manna, weren't they? They couldn't keep more than a day's supply. And if they tried to, it would mold and get wormy. And God was trying to teach them a lesson, and we learn a great principle in this, that we have to have a daily relationship with God. So our prayer life in times of time with God needs to be on a daily basis. You know, we can't just pray one time for the things in our lives. I mean, there's a prayer of faith, but you can't just pray a prayer of faith for everything. Do you understand that? I can't just go, one time I'm going to pray this prayer, I'm counting it done. You have to do intercession and battle because the enemy is going to contend with you. When you're praying for lost people, you just can't say, well, I claim that person for the kingdom, they're saved. End of discussion. You have to stand in the gap for them. You have to keep the devil off of them. Right. You have to pray. And that's why it doesn't work. You just pray one time for the nation because we're in a kingdom fight here, guys. We're in a battle. And just because you, I mean, matter of fact, when you pray, it stirs up demonic weaponry and the angels go into battle. The Bible says the angel of the Lord hearkeneth to the voice of the Lord to perform it. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. So when we pray to the Lord in accordance with the Word of God, the angels of God hearken to that and go into operation to bring it about. The Spirit of the Lord hearkens to it and brings it, begins to bring it about. And so the devil will stir up opposition against that. We find that with Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 10 where he sought the Lord for 21 days to find out what would happen to the nation of Israel in the latter days. And it says that the angel Gabriel finally came to him after 21 days and said, when you first prayed, you hear church? When you first prayed, your answer was on its way. Why did it take 21 days to get there then? So this is the issue, you know, with us. Many times we pray, we step out in faith, and it doesn't just poof, instantly come about. Why? Because there's opposition in the heavenlies. You know, the devil hears you when you pray too. That's why praying in tongues is a good thing. 
but the enemy knows what you're trying to do, and so the enemy will, will launch counterattacks to try to cut it off. He'll send opposition against you. And this is why many times when we're praying, we can see things can even get worse yeah. because we're in a battle. You know, just because, like World War II, Vietnam, wars we fought in the past, you know, just because we launched soldiers into the enemy's territory didn't mean they just ran for the hills. They counterattack, right? So we have to fight the fight of faith and stand firm, having done all to stand, stand therefore. So we're praying that our king, his kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So we need daily manna from heaven. We need daily sustenance with the Lord. We need daily prayer. We need daily time with God. We need to feed on the presence of God daily. It's not just a one-time prayer. Well, we threw up a prayer last Friday night. That ought to take care of it. I wish it was so simple. Man, we'd had a revival a long time ago if that were the case. But we got to continue to pray and stand and fight and intercede and lift up nations and kings and authorities and our lost loved ones and those who are being affected and afflicted and, and hammered by the devil. Amen? So we stand in faith. I believe that God will give us prayer projects things he specifically wants you to pray about. You know, like we're going to Tanzania in May, at the end of uh, August. We, we covet your prayers. Pray for our safety. You know, the devil knows we're going to Tanzania. He's not that stupid. He knows we're going to Tanzania. We need God to go before us, God to go behind us, God before us, God behind us, God around us, God upon us. We need his protection. We need his power. So that when we go there, we're, we're representatives of God. And when we leave there, the devil doesn't come and snatch away the seed that's been sown in their hearts. And when we come back here, you guys aren't beat to pieces because he attacks you. Because he will attack. He's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. You know, this is the issue with Christians. We think, well, you know, look what God did over here. Just wait. Just wait. Oh, everything's kind. Blue sky. <whistles> Blue skies for a few months until you let your guard down. And the devil send a bulldozer right into your house, man. Oh, Pastor Tim, you're being, you know, you're, you're just being sensational. No, I'm being real. The devil is a real adversary. And we have authority over him and his kingdom, but we must not be so naive as to take him lightly and ignore him or treat him frivolously. I mean, you can look all around you and see the carnage the devil's reaping, right? Well, is that the devil? Well, it's the devil's kids. Devil's kids stealing people, send them into slavery, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, killing people by the droves. It's the devil's kingdom people being influenced by the devil. Well, how are they going to get free from the devil? Prayer, standing before God for them, crying out to the Lord on their behalf. Amen? And asking God that he'd bring a revival and pour out his spirit upon his church to awaken the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So again, our prayer should always begin. They should end with praise and thanksgiving. Our, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. We need daily time with God. And forgive us our trespasses. In other words, we need God's forgiveness and mercy, don't we? As we forgive others. And why did Jesus throw that in there? Because there's another, instances, another incident where Jesus threw that in, and that's in Mark's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Well, he threw it in numerous places, but in Mark 11, chapter 23, he said, When you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against others, so that your Heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses, because if you won't forgive, neither will your Father forgive you. So if you have resentment or unforgiveness in your heart, it will greatly hinder your prayers. You, we cannot afford that. If we have something, what is he saying? Don't go talking to God and about these things until you talk to God about this. Get this right. Get that unforgiveness out of your life. You can't afford it. Because we can't, if, if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Bible says the Lord won't hear us. In other words, if we've got bitterness and unforgiveness toward our brothers, sisters, or somebody else, no wonder our prayers are not being very effective. Getting quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. Yeah, because 
Because if, if we're not right with God, if we've got bitterness or unforgiveness, it hinders our relationship with God. It hinders our prayer life. Can I meddle with you this morning? Or you will throw a stone or hit me in the head with a rock? This is important in your family too. Husbands and wives. You've got to reconcile with one another. You can't be bitter with your spouse. Do you know the Bible warns men about how they treat their wives? If they don't treat their wives as the weaker vessel, they don't treat them with respect, that it will hinder their prayers? Whoa! Heap them big words, Kimasaki. Yeah. That stuff, we can't afford it. Matter of fact, I've told this story before, and it's a really fantastic story, and it, at this moment, it would be good to repeat it. I remember years ago, Elaine Thompson lent me a book. It was called Murdered Heiress. It was about this very wealthy lady that had been abducted by, she was very wealthy, had a lot of servants, and she was actually abducted by her household servants. They plotted her murder, and they were going to steal all of her wealth. And she found out later, after she was delivered, that it was her staff that had plotted this. And they took her and they locked her in a room and uh, they chained her up to a, like a, kind of like a hospital gurney, I think it was. And they starved her and they tortured her. And um, the Lord's supernatural, she was a Christian, but she just wasn't really on fire for God. And um, the Lord, during this ordeal, it was quite an amazing story, but long story short, I don't want to get into too de great a detail, but the Lord supernaturally, they would bring her food, and one time when they brought her food, she was able to sneak and, and hide a spoon, it was metal spoons. And the Lord showed her how to take the spoon and use it as a screwdriver and get the screws off the gurney, and she got free. And she climbed through a window and escaped. Well, the, I remember the story distinctly. As she was climbing out the window to escape, suddenly the Lord spoke to her and said, I want you to pray for this person. It was somebody that she knew. It was her driver, her limo driver, your, your car driver. And then she was like, well, why should I pray for them? She said, he said, I want you to pray for them. And then as she was continuing to go, I want you to pray for this person. And all of them were people that she knew personally. They were her staff members. And it was starting to dawn on her because she knew who was doing this. Because she, But as she was getting out of the window, the Lord said, I want you to pray for them. Because if you don't pray for them, bitterness will enter your heart and it will affect you spiritually. So she prayed, Lord, I pray for forgiveness. I forgive this person. I forgive this person. I forgive. And she forgave all of them and was really set free. And she got out, and they were all, well, long story short, they didn't all get arrested, but every single one she prayed for, they ended up dying tragic deaths, like car accident, violent deaths, every single one of them. Now, I'm not saying that to you like, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> I'm going to pray for them, and Lord, you're going to kill them in a car accident or something like that. That's not what we want. That's not merciful. But that's what the Lord did in her instance. And the Lord was revealing to her, you can't afford to have this in your life. It will affect you spiritually. And she ended up getting set free and, uh, and wrote this book later on about this. And all these people ended up coming to justice but the point of the matter is we even, we're commanded by Jesus to even pray for enemies. Right. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's not always easy, but it's essential because we need to be able to pray to the Father with a clear conscience. We need to be able to come before the Lord without guilt, inferiority, or bitterness, or resentment, because it's going to affect how we pray and how well the Lord hears our prayers and how He will respond if we don't do that. And um, so, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In other words, we need God to forgive us uh, how, before we pray for other people to be f uh, for their needs and so on and so forth. So. Again, going back to this aspect of the kingdom of God being manifest on earth, because there's two primary aspects. I mean, prayer comes in a lot of shapes and forms. I mean, there's specific types of prayers in the Bible. There's what's called a prayer of faith. There's a prayer of intercession. There's a prayer of supplication. 
uh, there is, um, uh, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 when he was talking about put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. And he talked about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and the loins girt about with truth and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and so on and, and, uh, the, and, and all of the armament. And then he ends that whole section of Ephesians 6 by uh, praying always with all prayers and supplications. One translation says, pray at all times in every manner with every sort of prayer. So in other words, there's different kinds of prayer. Sometimes people think that prayer is just, my name is Timmy, I'll take all you gimme. <laughs> that they think prayer is just asking God for things. Thanksgiving worship is prayer. So when we come and we worship God, and you don't have to have a band, you don't necessarily have to have worship music on to worship God. Just get in the habit of worshiping God. Get in the habit of when things go bad in your life to say, well, praise be to God, or thank you, Jesus. Get in the habit of, of something happening, go, thank you, Lord, hallelujah. You know, a deer going to run out and smash your car. Oh, deer, it, oh my gosh, that deer's going to hit my car. No, just say, Jesus. You know, get in the habit, making your mouth, get in the habit of thanking God. Changing your vocabulary so it's filled with thanksgiving. Driving down the road, thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you, Lord. So, so praise becomes a natural thing. A thanksgiving becomes, well, that's not really praising God. I'm just saying words. Get in the habit. You know, if you practice it, your body and your mind will follow. Just make it a habit. So get in the habit of thanksgiving and praise and, and letting praise fill you. You know, we live in a wonderful world where you have bukus of, you know, you got worship music on your phone, you got CD players, you got everywhere you go, you can put worship music on, but you don't have to have that. Uh, it's good. I think it's good. Put, put worship music on in your house, put worship music on in your car. Uh, but you don't have to have that to worship the Lord. You don't have to wait. Well, I wish I was here on Sunday morning so I could come and worship the Lord and get free. You can get free right now and worship. Amen? Amen? Now, you know, I mean, it's great to come together in corporate worship and do worship, uh, come together as a group and worship God, but you don't have to do that, nor should you, you should practice that throughout the week. That should be a lifestyle of worship. Father, I thank you this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Father, I thank you and praise you. I enter your gates with thanksgiving. So every time you're going to pray, we just, Father, I just thank you that you hear me right now. Remind yourself that God's going to hear you. Because I think a lot of times Christians forget that God is actually hearing what they're saying. They just go through these religious rote motions like, well, let's pray. Let's get our mind focused on the fact that He actually is going to hear us right now. Because a lot of times this is what people will do. They'll pray a prayer and they go right out from that prayer and talk as if God didn't hear a word they just said. Well, I thought you just prayed about that. Well, yeah, I mean, well, we've done everything else. We might as well pray now. <laughs> no, let's let prayer be our first course. And I know that's not always easy, and I'm as guilty as anyone. My wife is much better about this than I am. Uh, my, my, my logical man mind that wants to figure things out logically. <laughs> Are you saying men aren't logical? <laughs> I was talking to somebody on Facebook the other day, a friend of mine out of Africa, and she said uh, something about men not being able to find their things unless it's in their out, outstretched arms. And I, and I said, well, I contend my wife hides stuff on purpose just so I can't find it. So uh, anyhow, I've always said that since we got married, especially my pants. But anyhow, so... Uh, uh, but I don't know what I was talking about before that. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> but the, the point of the matter is that um, we need to get in the habit of exercising prayer on a daily basis. We need to make prayer our first course of action, not our last course of action. But we need to remind ourselves that the Lord is actually hearing us. And, and I think this is a great other exercise we can do when it comes to prayer. You know, again, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So I, I heard somebody say this years ago, they said this is a great exercise, and I think it is a good exercise. When you're going to pray to the Father, if you need to close your, you know, and I'm not saying you can do this all the time, but it's a, just a good principle. Try to get a picture of God in your imagination. You know, if you're looking at issues and problems and God is far from your thoughts, it's pretty hard to pray to this God who's going to transform something when He's far from your thoughts. 
I want to imagine God coming. When, Lord, when I talk to you right now, I believe you're going to hear what I say. And I believe that when I say it, you're going to lead me how to say it because I got the Holy Ghost. And I think it's a good rule of thumb is when you pray as well to just talk to the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, when we pray here, when I pray here, give us the words to say. I don't know how to pray as I should. Uh, you know, some people, you know, I know what to pray for. Not really. I don't know how to pray for as I don't know how to pray about this situation. Well, I can pray in tongues, but I believe the Lord also wants to tell us how to pray about this. What do you want me to ask? How do you want me to pray? Because we always start out in the natural and we move over into the spiritual. See, when we have like what we call corporate prayer, anytime you pray, pray. I don't want to spend all my prayer life praying up here. And that's about as far as a lot of Christians ever get. They pray right here all the time. And, and this, you know, I grew up in a church system, and many of you did too up in northern Wisconsin, where the only form of prayer that people ever did is so-and-so is going to get up and lead us in prayer now. And they pray. Shh, they're praying. Can't you hear they're praying? Don't you think God can hear everybody? So what we do, what we do is we tend to pray that way a lot, like, okay, they're praying here, so I'm just going to be quiet. No, the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, they all lifted up their voice in one accord. They all prayed at the same time. Every single one, they all lifted up their voice in one accord and prayed. That's called unified prayer, corporate prayer. If I'm praying in a corporate prayer meeting, that means I'm praying with a bunch of people. It's like if I was going to move this, if I was going to move one of these speakers over here or some piano or something, you know, we got a big piano next door, and I've moved a lot of pianos with my piano playing wife over there. You know, if I've got four people and we're going to move a piano, I need you to take hold of one corner of the piano. I'm going to take a hold of a corner of the piano. We're all going to take hold of the piano, and we're all going to lift the piano together. If I'm the only one lifting the piano, we're not going very far. So you get the point. Sometimes when people pray, the only one lifting the piano is the one praying. And they're like, well, I wish they'd stop praying. I don't know what I'm doing here. I need you to lift with me here. I need you to take hold of God with me. One can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. Let's take hold of God together. Let's lift our voices up to God together. Let's work together. Let's battle together. Let's pray in unity together because together we can do more than we can do alone. And if we can get more together praying together in unity, it creates greater power. That is the challenge when you come together in corporate prayer, is to get people to pray and flow together. Amen. Well, there's a lot in this, and we're going to wrap it up this morning. But Father, we thank you today that as we pray, you hear us. That when we lift up our voices, your ears are open to our cries. We thank you, Father, that you are a faithful Father. And that when we pray, you do hear us. When we call unto you, you will answer us and show us great and marvelous things which we do not know. Father, it has not entered into the heart or the minds of men or people the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But you have revealed them to us by the Holy Spirit. Father, we rejoice in you this morning that as we cry unto you, as we pray, as we seek you, you will answer us. You will hear us. You will send out your angels to do battle. You will send forth your spirit into the realms of the earth. You will see the evil and see the good, and you will bring about your kingdom to bear on the things of this world. Lord, there's nothing you cannot see, and there's nothing you do not know, and there's nothing in this world that we're stirred up about that you're not stirred up about as well. But, Father, we rejoice in you today. We praise you this morning that... You put those things in our heart. You give us the desires of our heart. You stir up our hearts so that we will exercise the authority you've already given us and call out to you. Jesus, you said that you don't have because you don't ask. 
So Lord, we pray that we would be people who are not afraid, intimidated, or negligent to ask you for great and marvelous things. Father, expand our horizons, expand our vision, expand our imagination. Father, expand the body of Christ's ideas and thoughts as to what could take place in this nation and in the world if we would simply believe and trust you and call upon you to do it. Father, help our unbelief. Forgive us for our lack of faith. Forgive us for our lack of vision. Forgive us for reducing you to human level instead of rising and raising our eyes to you, the God who is well able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think or even imagine. You are well able to do it, Father. Forgive us for not believing that you can. Because if we really believed it, Father, we would be asking you to do it. So, Father, we pray for the body of Christ in this nation. We pray for your people all over this nation, all over this world, that you would raise up a great prayer army in this hour to do battle and stand in faith and call on heaven to come into the earth and change this nation. I want you to stand your feet right now, if you would, and let's just lift our voice this morning before we dismiss. Let's lift our voice together, and I want you to cry out to the Lord just for a few minutes here together. I want you to just lift up your voice together as if God were hearing you this morning when you're praying, as if God were hearing you this morning. I just want you to lift up your voice to the Lord. I will call on the Lord, and He will answer me. I will cry unto to my, unto the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Hallelujah. The heartfelt, fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman, makes great power available, dynamic in its working. Father, we cry out to you this morning. We call upon you this morning. We lift up our voice in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you that you hear us when we cry this morning. Father, your ears are open to the prayers of the people of God. We thank you that we can come boldly into the throne of grace. We rejoice in you, Father, for your mercies which are new every morning. We thank you for your faithfulness and steadfast love. We thank you that your name is exalted in the heavens and in the earth. And Father, we worship and magnify you today. Great is the Lord and worthy of honor. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Lord, you are the God of all kings. You are above all kings. You are above all nations. Father, we want to extol you. We want to let you know how how worthy you are. Father, none of the things of this earth, none of the men of this earth, none of the kings of this earth are anything as compared to you this morning. We rejoice in you, Father, that you're the one that sets kings up. You're the one that brings kings down. You're the one that establishes nations. You're the one that set the boundaries of the ocean. You're the one that said, let there be light, and there was light. You're the one that said, no further, and there was no further. Lord, you are the one. You are the great and mighty king. You made the heavens your glory and the, the earth your glory your footstool, Father. We rejoice in you. We praise you. We exalt you. We exalt your name. We exalt your name. We praise your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to tell you something. When we talk about how big God is, our big God shows up. Amen? Amen? You look at the book of Acts in chapter 4 when Peter was arrested and it says they lifted up their voices in one accord, and it actually tells us what they prayed. They said, Oh Lord, you hear what the people are saying. It's right out of Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the nations imagine a vain thing? Why do the kings of the earth come and plot together against you and your holy son? The Lord will have them in derision. The Lord will. It says, kiss the Lord, kiss the Lord, so that he does not become angry with you and you perish from the earth. They lifted up their voice and they reminded God of who he was. They bragged on God. They, pro they proclaimed how big God was. And he said, now, Lord, hear their threatenings and grant unto your servants so we might behold, we might stretch forth our hands to do great and signs and wonders. The Lord shook the place where they were seated. Uh, uh, the angel of the Lord went and delivered Peter out of, the king, out of jail and brought him to the very fence. It was such a supernatural thing that the little maiden girl, the young girl comes out and finds Peter at the door and she's astounded, doesn't even believe it's him. 
She goes back and tells them Peter's at the door, and they go, oh, couldn't be Peter. Must be his angel. Isn't that awesome? You know, they're praying for God to do something, and God does it, and they don't even believe what he did. It's so awesome. So praise God. We're going to wrap it up this morning, but prayer, we just want to encourage you to call upon the Lord, seek the Lord, and let's lift up our voices to the Lord for the nation for our families, for this area. We need a revival, folks. We need the power of God in America. We need a change in America. We need changes in our families, changes in our homes, changes uh, in this area. And only God can do it, amen? amen? That God would raise up men and women, raise up leaders, raise up people who would be His instruments in this hour, and to God be all the glory and all the praise forever and forever and forever. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Well, Lord, we bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord grant you his peace that passes all understanding. May you go against me. Your enemies come against you one way and flee from you seven. May the blessings of Abraham come upon you. May the covenant of our God rest in your home and upon all you do in Jesus' name. Amen.